is Don Stop. I personally experienced estrangement from one of my adult children. This is beyond the pain. I hope this will be a place where parents of estranged adult children can find peace and healing. I will share some of my experiences as well as some from other parents. The goal is to bring this out of the shadows and stop being ashamed, and then to build up and inspire you. You can find my podcast on Google, Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. My email address is beyondthepainpodcast at gmail.com. Hello, and welcome to Learn to Love, a show where we talk all about things you can do to build a better, stronger relationship. Our team is powered by passionate volunteers looking to bring forward the best of what they know to help you stay together. Love is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Our podcast, articles, and videos feature insights from the latest research on relationship psychology, intimacy, conflict resolution, parenting, and more. You don't need to go in blind and make the same mistakes as those around you. Check us out on our brand new website at learnlove.ca or listen on our podcast, the Learn to Love podcast. Thank you for joining us in our vision to create healthier relationships and stronger families. Hi guys, welcome back to the show. We are super excited to welcome you today to a super fun, super interesting topic, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. So the first time that I heard about The Five Love Languages was when I was traveling, I was studying abroad, and I came across the book and Actually, I got the audiobook for this one. I listened to it. I made notes on it. It was so interesting that I actually finished the whole book in about three hours. And I called my partner and I said, oh my God, you're not going to believe it. This is amazing. There are a lot of quizzes and stuff. It's kind of fun in popular culture now what these five love languages are. Maybe you've heard about them before. Uh, if you've heard about them or you're going to hear about them in the podcast, we're going to share new insights because we're going we're gonna to actually add analogies to these these languages. So even if you heard of them before, this podcast is going to be new and interesting to you. And uh, what we recommend to anybody who hasn't read the book yet or hasn't read the book in a while, you should read it. It's it's really good. It's really interesting. And it's also kind of engaging and, and pretty funny too. Okay. So the five love languages. And I just want to say, not only was I so excited when I read this book, but I, I also made a list of what I thought mine and my partner's love languages were. And then I, I told them and they were like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it was like, yeah. And then no. And then, oh. And then, wow, I feel like we really understand each other better. So where do these love languages come in? If you remember from the last episode, we talked about the idea of a relationship being like a car. Now, the car needs gas to function right? It has an engine. Whenever the relationship is on, the the car is running, it's using gas. We need to get gas in the tank. Now, a lot of partners are going to be pumping gas, but it's not the right kind of gas. They're putting diesel in a petrol car and the car just isn't running. We spoke about the stages of a relationship. Just to quickly recap, we said that in the last episode, they go from romance, lust, that initial really cool, excited, like, wow, you know, amazing hormones, really, really exciting, beautiful introductory phase of the relationship, which we basically is the only phase that we see portrayed in media. Okay. Like if, if you're not in this phase, that's, that's okay. It means that you're in the other stages. There are other stages too. Don't forget. Don't be like one of those so many couples that break up when they finish the first stage because they think that they're doing it wrong. No, you're doing it right. This is normal. Okay. Stages. It's plural. They're multiple. You don't need to get stuck in the first one. And it's also a really beautiful thing when you move beyond because we believe here on the show that love is knowing 
You can only love yourself as much as you know yourself. And you can only love your partner as much as you know your partner. So I hope that through getting to these later stages, you can know your partner more, know more things to love about them, and just understand them better. Okay, so the five love languages come in to the end of that first lost kind of romance stage and into the transition to the second stage, which is a bit of a struggle. We called it struggle because it's hard. It's hard for a lot of couples to figure out what their partner wants and expects of them. The little things that you don't notice right away, but, but you start to discover as you know the person for longer. It's, it's a little bit hard what your partner's soft spots are. These may not appear right at the beginning. And even if a bit of them appear, you're going to get to know them better. Trust us. You're going to get to know them better as the relationship continues. And that's a good thing because they're really beautiful. So these languages are going to help you understand your partner more. Okay, so what are the five love languages? These are the five most common ways that people receive love and express love with their partners. Also, there's another book that we read. It's the five languages of appreciation in the workplace, also by Gary Chapman, which is like how you can apply this, not just in your relationship, but also in your workplace, also with your friends, with your community. Now, I want you to think before we reveal them to you, what the five are. What do you think are the five most common ways that people share and receive love? I want you to think, what's the first one? Have it in your head. What do you think another one is? Another one. You know, before you reveal them, I actually want you to think about this in your own life. What are ways that you share and receive love? You can think about it this way. If you want to do something for your partner, to show your partner that you love them, what is it that you do for them? Do you run to buy them a gift, like flowers or something? Do you unload the dishwasher? Do you hug them and hold them? Do you tell them something nice about themselves? Like, I really love your eyes. You're wearing my favorite eyes today. Or do you do something like you sit together across the table, you make tea, and you just talk without your cell phones, without any distractions. You just talk. Okay, out of that list, I want you to think, what is your favorite idea out of there? What do you do with your partner? Really, really think about it. Like, what do you do to show your partner love? Okay, now that you thought about it, if you're not done thinking, pause the podcast right over here. If you are, let's get right into it. Let's talk. What are those five languages? Okay. The first language that we're going to bring up here is going and getting your partner a gift, like flowers or something, or a new mouse pad with a picture of you guys on it, or something you, you, to, to share something with them, you're giving them something, you're giving them a gift. So this is the first love language we're going to talk about, gifts. The next love language is you tell your partner something like, hey, I really love your eyes. Did anyone ever tell you how beautiful your eyes are? That is words of affirmation. Affirmation, things like things that you tell your partner that you think will make them happy, that are supposed to make them happy, like good things, nice things. You're affirming them. You're helping them feel good about themselves. The next love language is acts of service. So what are acts of service? Acts of service are when you do things to help your partner 
often this looks like chores, but it can look like other things too. It can be something like calling calling somebody on their birthday, like in your partner's family. Like that's like or or helping your partner with something if they forgot something on the way home or like if you notice something's missing in the house, you pick it up. Acts of service or uh, the big one unloading the dishwasher. Now, it's really interesting. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, John Gottman in The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work says that partners find it really attractive when the other does chores. Okay? I know a lot of you are thinking like, ugh, chores. But trust me, your partner is going to find it attractive. Well, according to this book, most partners find it attractive if the other partner does chores, helps them something without being asked. Okay, it's just like a helping hand. Okay, so that is acts of service. The next one we're going to talk about is quality time. Now, quality time, a lot of people, I think, misunderstand this because we live in a society today that encourages the opposite Quality time is really when you just sit with your partner without your phone. You're just present. You notice each other and you talk what's on your mind. This used to be so common before everyone started distracting themselves with checking their Instagram or their Facebook, reading the news. There's so much you can do. Check your Twitter, guys. When your phone beeps in the background, it's really distracting. Sometimes, sometimes. Depends if this is your partner's love language. But if your partner is the kind of person that really likes quality time, they just want to be present with you. Maybe this is their main love language. Quality time. Now, there are variations of these languages too. So for example, we can expand on quality time to quality experiences. Some partners really love it when they share experiences together, like when they travel together, they go hiking together, they go swimming together in the community center pool, or they go for a walk together. They just really like being together and doing experiences together, like exploring together. Some people really like this and and some people don't. So you have to think, like, is this something my partner likes? We're going to get to tips to know what your partner's language is and what your language is a little bit later. And the last love language that we're going to talk about here is physical touch. Some people absolutely love physical touch. Now, everyone misunderstands what physical touch is, okay? A lot of people think that it's only sex, okay? And that's not what we're talking about here. It can be. It can be. It is a type of physical touch, but it is not really what we mean when we discuss physical touch. What are we talking about? Physical touch, I mean, it depends on your partner and what they're into. Remember, you have to ask them You have to ask them. Don't just assume that they like the same thing as you because as we're going to explore more later, but it's, it's very, very common that you and your partner don't have the same love language, okay? So if you think that this is something that they want, you have to confirm because maybe, maybe that's not the case. Okay, we're going to get into that. But before, okay, physical touch. It's a lot more of other things. For example, holding hands putting your arms around each other, holding your partner, like putting your arms around your partner and looking them in the eyes and telling them that they're beautiful, okay? That's physical touch combined with words of affirmation. Or stroking your partner, like lying down together, cuddling and putting your hand on their cheek and stroking their cheek, okay? Or putting your hand on their shoulder, on their side, and just making lines kind of with your fingers on their arms. Some people 
are terrified by the thought of this. Absolutely terrified. It sounds like anxiety provoking and they don't want it. They don't like it. It's not them. It's not going to work for them. No, okay. It's, it's not their love language. But some guys, some people love, love to have this touch. And there's some studies that show that it's extremely important, this kind of touch for partners to feel safe with each other comfortable with each other and to be truly intimate with each other. Now in Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson, absolutely brilliant book on this subject, Sue Johnson spends a significant portion of the book talking about the benefits of physical touch. So I want you to think, what is the biggest organ in the body? What is the biggest organ? You could say that it's the skin, the skin. It's, it's all over our body and it's full, guys, full of nerve receptors. If couples aren't touching each other, Sue says in her book, it is a really, really big red flag that things are going downhill and they're going to go downhill fast. By touch, she means, again, the little things, holding hands holding each other, hugging, okay, arms around each other, this kind of stuff. Because this also expanded further in her book and in The Body Keeps the Score, another brilliant, brilliant book by Bessel van der Kogel. They say that the body feels close and safe, safe with another and calm through physical touch with somebody that they trust, okay? So if you trust your partner and you want to make them feel safe, you can ask them if it's okay with them if you hug them or if you hold them, okay? You know that kind of like in the movies where there's one partner and they're like in the other partner's arms and they feel really safe? So like, that's real. Like, you can have a sense of safety if your partner likes physical touch, especially so, by holding them in your arms. Now, there's a number of reasons why I think this is becoming less common today. The first one being because media promotes a sense of intimacy, like sexual intimacy as the only intimacy, and relationships being all about this lust romance at the beginning. So because of that, I think a lot of partners actually aren't sure of their ability to be good at touch or love. And this is further, further exacerbated through things you can find on the internet that show other couples engaging in in intimate physical activity, which is really not intimate. We're going to talk about what is physical intimacy further in another episode, but it's just really not true intimacy. Um... And they look at this and they hear about this or they see on, on the news, uh, you know, movies, other kinds of other people or even on their social media, everyone is seeing other people and they think, you know what, like maybe I'm not good at this. And they're scared to hold their partner and they're scared to approach their partner because they don't actually know if they're a good lover. And it's like their anxiety of not knowing if they're a good lover is preventing them from even engaging in the loving at all. Like, they want to engage, but they're so scared to engage because of what they see. Maybe they don't feel good enough, that they don't engage at all, which makes it even worse. Now, in Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nyquist, she talks about this a lot more. Um, We're going to explore that also in future episodes. But her book is about numbing to avoid feeling something because you don't want to feel it, so you distract yourself by doing something else. But the thing that you're distracting actually makes it worse. For example, like you feel bad that you're not holding your partner. So whenever you get anxious, you go on your phone because we live in a culture that promotes not feeling. Like you're not you're not supposed to feel. If you get anxious, you should go on your phone and forget about it, which you know we're not we're not any at all we're big fans of on this show. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about numbing in future episodes. Um, but she's basically saying like her anxiety comes from not being present with her family. But the more that she numbs herself with work, the less present she is with her family, which makes her have to numb even more 
which makes her even less present with her family until the midlife crisis. Can you relate to this? Like, where she realizes this. Are you numbing? Is it taking you away from your family? And are you numbing because you feel like you're not good enough? Or not a good lover? Or not, not worthy of sharing love? Or, or being loved? It's so easy to see what everyone else is doing today. Do you feel like you just... You can't, you can't be like them? Now, if you feel this way, which I think everyone feels this way a little, that's okay. Know that... You're not alone. I mean, this is the, the society we live today. But we don't have to feel that way. We can do things like write a list of things about ourselves that we want to believe. For example, I am worthy of love. I can be a good lover. I am worthy of having a good strong bond with my family let's say like your children for example or your husband or spouse anyone else in your community or you can say things like I am as good as other people around me you can write a list and you can repeat that list back to you every single day read it in the morning when you wake up make a list of like 10 things Okay, things like, I got this, I can, I can get better, I am strong, I am worthy of love, and I can give love. Okay, and you can repeat that to yourself every day, and after a couple days, maybe 10 days, you'll start to feel it, because your thoughts become your reality. If you really believe something and you repeat it to yourself, I hope that it will help you feel better. This was first introduced to me in a book called Unfuck Yourself, uh, Get Out of Your Head and Into Your Life by J- Gary John Bishop. That's Gary John Bishop. So, It's also talked about by Zachary Stockhill, but we're going to talk more about his book, Overcoming Retroactive Jealousy, and in future episodes on getting over you or your partner's past. Okay, so let's get back. We we talked about the five love languages. We talked a little bit about not feeling good enough and how that feeling can prevent us from engaging with these languages, kind of like feeling like we shouldn't be engaging with them. And we talked a little bit about how to overcome this fear of engagement through making a list and through acknowledging some of the reasons why we might be feeling this way. Okay, now let's get into these languages more and let's have some fun, guys. Let's discover what our love language is. Okay, so first, we said this already. I'm going (laughs) to drill it down again. Your language is probably not your partner's language, so you need to figure this out, and it's fun to figure it out. Don't be stressed. How can you figure out what your language is? Okay, here's some questions I want you to think about, and you can write them down if this exercise takes a lot of time, or you can pause this podcast right over here and think about it and then get back to the show. The first question to figure out your love language is this. When you want to love your partner, what do you do to show them that you love them. Let's say, for example, you're really, really happy with your partner and you're just like, you're so happy with them and you just, you really want to show them that you love them, okay? What what comes to mind? Like, what is like the, I'm going to do this to show them that I love them? Okay, think about it. Do you rush to think about buying them a gift? Do you rush to like arrange Uh, like, I don't know, some trip together? Do you rush to make like a super romantic evening when you can just talk? Do you rush to clean the house, clean everything, unload the, you know, everything, everything, make the house super nice and do all the chores and pick up their dry cleaning for them and, and this kind of stuff? Or do you hold them and dream about this like time together where you can just hold them and, and melt into each other? If I, if I can use that expression on the show. Um, okay. Now, why, why this question? 
Because your answer to this question is probably going to be your love language. This is so important, guys. Your language is probably what you are trying to do for your partner. Now, guys, this is beautiful, but this is also a problem. Because if your language is Japanese and your partner's language is French, okay, you might be speaking the most beautiful, beautiful Japanese on the planet. But it's not going to make your partner feel loved the way you expect them to. Now, a lot of partners get mad at this, at this, because they're thinking, I try so hard and you don't appreciate me or like, I try so hard and you don't notice what I do. I feel like I'm trying and it's going nowhere. Have you ever felt this way before? Have you ever felt or thought to yourself that I'm really trying hard, but it's just, it's not, it's not like, like, I just, I feel like I work so hard, but you don't even notice. Do you feel that way? I think everyone has felt that way at some point in their life. Now, guys, it's not that your partner isn't noticing. Okay, I mean, okay, if you are in a bad place in your relationship and you think badly about each other, you might be going through this cycle. We call it the cycle of doom because it's doom. Okay, we're going we're gonna to put an infographic on this on our blog and get more into it. But it's possible that you might just think badly about each other. If you think that the other partner is bad, if, if you're like very angry with them or something, it's possible that you don't notice because you're just like angry at your partner and you can't notice the good things that they do if you don't expect to see them. I want you to ask yourself this question to figure out if this is the reason, okay, why you feel like, do you ever notice? Like, I'm trying so hard and you don't notice. This is the first thing it could be. It could be, what lens do you see the world by? So this is, are you like really mad at your partner? Because, and, and you're just not seeing it because you have the wrong lens. So the analogy I want to use for this is, remember, I don't know if you guys remember if it's giving away our age on the show or something. But do you remember when you used to watch a 3D movie? Like, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I remember Shark Boy and Lava Girl. It was like 3D. It was the coolest thing ever. I mean, when we were younger. And it had a red and blue 3D glass. Do you remember those glasses, like the red and the blue ones, where like one side is red and the other one is blue? If, if you don't remember, then you, you must come from like... It's giving away our age here, if you don't remember. But um, that that's what I mean by lens. If, if you don't remember what I'm talking about, because it wasn't around when you grew up, because you guys have better technology, <laughs> I want you to just imagine, like, you know, like a binder divider that you had in school, maybe? You know, like, it's like a plastic thing, and you put it between pages in your binder, and it has the tabs on it to tell you, like, like what section of your binder it is? You know, sometimes you can, like... It's like, let's say it's red and you can kind of see through it, but not so much. And you hold it up to a light, like a white light in your classroom when you're really bored. And then you like close one eye and the light looks red through that filter. Okay, this is what I mean by like, what lens are you seeing the world by? Because if you hold a red lens, it's only going to show you red light. Okay, this is this is why it looks red. Okay, because it only lets a red light through it. So you, you only see like red when you look through it. it. It blocks every other light and only lets in red. Or take, for example, like a blue lens. You have a white light and you hold up the blue plastic in front of the light and you only see like blue. The light looks blue, but it's actually not blue, it's white. Okay, like those, those fluorescent lights. Um... Why is this important? If somebody holds a blue light, okay, and you see a red, and let's say like they're shining a blue laser at you, okay, and you look from it, you look at it through the red lens, it's not going to look blue, okay? The red is going to totally distort that color. It's the same thing with if you hold like a white light, to the, to the red lens. It's not going to look white. It's going to look red. It doesn't matter how white the light is on the other side of the lens. If you are seeing the world through a red lens, you will always see red. 
And it's that simple. If you are angry and you see the world through anger, you will always see anger no matter how hard anyone tries to show you something else or no matter how hard someone else is showing you a different thing, you will always see the world with that taint of red. This is so important. So that that's the first reason it could be. We're going to explore lenses more in future episodes. But the reason I bring it up here, because cause we asked the question, if you tell your partner, like, I try so hard and you don't notice, it might be because you guys are in the cycle, okay? And we call it the cycle of doom, because usually partners are both trying, but the, each partner can't see because because they see the other partner through anger. So the less you can see your partner's true intentions, the more your lens builds up, like the more angry you get at them, the more you see through anger, and then you see even less of their intentions, and then you see even more with anger, and blah, 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 you know, you see the cycle, boom, 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 accelerates, and then usually there's a big disconnection, or there's a divorce, unless the partners realize how skewed their vision is, and see reality for what it is again. We're going to explore these two cycles, the cycle of doom and the cycle of growth. The cycle of growth is the opposite. It's when you see through a lens of love. So you see things more through love. So for example, you're always looking for the good intentions. You notice the good intentions way more. John Gottman talks about this in his book, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Partners who expect good in their partner notice more good. Okay, it's that simple. I'll give you an example. One partner brings flowers home to the other partner, you know, and the other partner is so happy that they brought flowers that they give them a big hug and tell them that they love them and doesn't stop smiling the whole evening and then gives them a massage in the evening before bed because they're just so happy with them. And then the other partner is so happy that the their partner gave them a massage that in the morning they make their partner breakfast and they wake up early and they set up everything and they clean everything nicely for their partner. And their partner is super, super happy and gives them a big hug. And then, you know, they're so happy they got breakfast that they make the partner a card to go in their lunch. And the partner's so happy they got a card in their lunch that they, you know, come home early to help prepare dinner. And, and you see the cycle. It just leads to more and more and more love and more and more and more growth. That's the opposite because you, you, can't, you expect to see good. You actually notice good. And I honestly believe that a lot of couples don't actually notice the good that the other partner does. So, like, I think most couples maybe notice, like, I don't know, anywhere from, like, half to two-thirds of the intentions and, like, the, the effort of the other partner and even less if they're, if they're in, a, in a bad cycle of doom. That would be, like, maybe 10% or even less. So, awful. Don't, don't go there. It's not good. But if you're there, recognize, remember this lens analogy, and I hope it'll help you get out of there because you can get out of the cycle. It is possible, guys. It is possible. Okay. Read more about the books where we're talking about here, if, if you want to learn about that. Okay, or or listen, we're going to get into that in later episodes of our podcast too, but we want to keep each episode relatively short, so we're not going to talk about everything. Okay, so the first reason that your partner is because of the cycle and the lens, okay? I'm trying so hard you don't notice. Another reason, guys, what's the other reason? We hinted at it this whole show. What's the other reason your partner may not notice? Guys, you're not speaking their language. This is usually, usually the main thing going on here, okay? You can kind of tell if you're in the cycle of doom. It means like, you know, you're not happy with your partner. But if you're otherwise kind of like happy and satisfied with your partner and your relationship, but you feel like it's not really like... They're, they're not really noticing what you're doing. Maybe they're noticing, but it just doesn't speak to them. Okay? And I see this all the time. All the time. One partner compliments the other all the so often. They're always complimenting the partner. Okay? You look so beautiful. I love the way you did this. That was so nice of you. This makes, you know, it made me feel so good when you did this. And the other partner 
doesn't compliment back, rarely ever compliments. And you think, they don't love me. Listen to this line, guys. It's so critical. It's so important. They don't love me. That's what you think. Because they're not complimenting you. And, and you're pulling out your hair. You're thinking like, I don't know if this is going to work out. I just feel like they don't love me. And guys, you know what's going on? Your partner has no idea that you think this. Absolutely no idea. Because you see the world through such different lenses. But not the other lenses that we're talking, like the same concept lens, but not not the cycle thing. Guys, it's a love language problem. Your partner isn't complimenting you because they don't see why they should compliment you. Maybe they grew up in a household or a culture where compliments just weren't given. Okay, if you don't compliment somebody, it means that they're good enough and they're doing a good job. I find this is more common in European cultures. Okay, and, and Russian cultures, although I'm not an expert on this, and I'm, I'm not an expert, by the way, in anything we talk about. This is just for informational use only. We're not experts. Um, but I hope that this information may be of help to you, but it does not count as expert advice, okay? I find in North American cultures, compliments are a lot more common. So, like, in North America at least going to school in North America or summer camps, you're going to get a lot of compliments. And so I think, I think kids kind of who grow up in North America or who grow up in a home where there's a lot of compliments get the sense that I need to get compliments to know that I'm doing a good job. Like the norm is getting compliments. So if you don't get a compliment, it means that you're not doing a good job. But the opposite is true. Like from a European culture where if you don't get a compliment, it means that you're doing a good job. It's like, it's like, you know, it's, it's that difference there. So like North Americans are waiting for this compliment, whereas Europeans are like, you know, we don't like, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? So you have your one partner who's freaking out. I don't get complimented. And you have the other partner, which I'm telling you guys does not even notice that it could be the compliments. That's the problem. <laughs> That's why we call this phase struggle. Struggle is hard, okay? But it's fun. It's so much fun. It's like it's like you are on a huge adventure to uncover this like incredible treasure, okay? Like it's hard, like Indiana Jones style hard, okay? Like like it's challenging sometimes. But when you find the treasure, and that treasure is understanding, a sense of understanding and love from your partner. And a strong sense of love that only grows with them. Guys, love is supposed to grow over the years, okay? Not shrink. <laughs> grow through getting into these stages. That is so, it's so beautiful. It's so nice, okay? It's like uncovering that treasure, Indiana Jones style. So you got to have this conversation with your partner. Guys, what are compliments? Compliments are words of affirmation. So the one partner's love language is words of affirmation. You got to tell that to your partner. You got to be like, hey, I was listening to the Learn to Love podcast and they talked about the five love languages from Gary Chapman and they are so interesting and cool and we need to find our love languages. (laughs) There are tons of quizzes online that can help you with this. But the big thing, guys, just think, what do you do when you try to show love to your partner? That's another, it's just a big one. On that topic, we can also ask you, what are things that your partner does that don't make you feel loved? Okay, this is so, so critical and so important for uncovering if it's quality time. Okay, but also for other things too. But I think, I think especially quality time. Let's say that you're talking to your partner and they pull out their phone while you're in the middle of talking to them and it's just, you're so offended. Like, it's so hurtful that they pulled out their phone. That is so disrespectful that they pulled out their phone. That's what you think. But guys, it's disrespectful to you. It may not feel disrespectful to them that they pulled out their phone. Maybe they don't consider phone use like anything that impedes the conversation. Maybe they're using the phone for numbing, okay, which is an issue. But maybe the phone just isn't something significant to them. The phone doesn't, for them, affect quality time, or maybe quality time just isn't their main love language. That's why you got to talk about it. 
Another thing it can help you uncover is like, let's say physical touch. So like, let's say your partner touches you on the cheek and you're like, oh my God, anxiety. Okay, that's that's okay. Maybe it's related to something in your past. Maybe it's related to an, an acceptance of your self-issue. You know, maybe we don't feel that we're lovable. And we always wish that somebody would hold us or touch us in this way. And then when it happens, it's too overwhelming because it spins our whole worldview upside down. Because we, for the longest time, we felt that this wasn't us, and then we got it. And it's like, my brain cannot process that this is me. This is too overwhelming in the moment. That could be a reason. We're going to explore that further in another another episode, okay? About crying, walls. What are walls? How do they affect your relationship? How can you know what your walls are? And what is it like to break them? Guys, it's hard to break walls, okay? Crying happens when you break walls often, but you get to know each other better if it's done in the right way, okay? Okay, so what were those two questions? Just to summarize. So first step was, when you try to show love to your partner, what comes to mind? That's a sign it's your love language, okay? When, what are things that your partner does that make you feel uncomfortable? That's a sign, A, that it's their love language. If they're doing something to show you love, it's probably related to the way they want you to make them feel loved. Okay, they're doing it because that's their like instinct of giving love. Okay, so it's like that's probably what they feel love is. That's probably what they're like. Hint, hint. Maybe you should do that to them. (laughs) Maybe it would make them feel good. But guys, if 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 it doesn't make you feel love, the opposite of that maybe is your love language. So let's say that it really doesn't make you feel loved when your partner pulls out their phone. Okay, so the opposite of that is maybe having a conversation without phones, maybe it's quality time, okay? Maybe it's quality time. Now, the final question I want you to think about to uncover your love language is, when you were younger, what are ways that your parents and the other important people in your life showed love to you? Childhood, guys, is a really, 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 really important thing in our relationships. We're going to have an entire series dedicated to childhood, and it's a major, major part of our blog, which is currently in development. But we have something like eight articles on childhood, uh, which are in the planning stages and early preparation stages right now. We're hoping to release those over the next three or so months. So this is so important, guys, because the way that your parents showed love to you, it's maybe that's how you learned through all the years of observation and experience love to be. For example, did your parents show you that they appreciate you by giving you gifts if you did really well in school or if you did really well, I don't know, in like in an in a activity or something? Maybe you learned over time that I'm rewarded by gifts when I do something well, that gifts are really important to being a, as a reward. So so that's your love language, like gifts. Gifts are so important to you. I want you to really think about it. And again, you can pause the podcast here at any any point and just really think, like, is this is this the way my parents showed me love? Another really, really, really big one is... Were your parents not available so much when you were younger? Like, were your parents always at work or on their phone or busy or struggling, you know, just not really spending so much time with you? And then, you know, occasionally they took you to the park and they played soccer with you or baseball or football or like just something. And in that moment... You felt so much love. You felt so good. Like, so happy. Maybe your love language is quality time then. Maybe that's what you want from your partner. Growing up, you always dreamed of the moments when you can just be together 
you know, you missed, you missed it so much. And now that you have your partner, the thing that hopefully you love more than anything else in the world, that's, that's what you want with them. All right, guys. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you found it meaningful and insightful. Let's summarize everything that we talked about. So we started with a recap of the last episode, which was stages of a relationship. Again, in this show, we're calling them lust or romance, the first kind of hormone stage. And then after that, we go to struggle because it's hard to get to know your partner. It's hard to find the treasure in Indiana Jones, but it's worth it when you find it. It's an amazing, amazing treasure to have. After that, we get to working. This is when you figure out, you know, how, how it works. You, you know how to get the right gas in, okay? You know how to use the right nozzle. You're pumping, and you're not, like, it's efficient pumping. It's like, it's like you're putting a lot of effort. You're, you're getting a lot of gas, but the gas is going in the tank, guys. This is what we're all, all about. We want to get the maximum amount of gas that we can in the tank, okay? Because... Like, imagine that you were filling up your car. And guys, so many couples do this. And this is so bad. Like, like just inefficient. Gas is really expensive in a lot of countries, okay? Like, let's say that your tank is 50 liters. We're using liters, not gallons. By the way, if you haven't noticed, we're, for this whole series, because we're filming right now in Toronto. Um, so in Toronto, we use liters. I'm sorry for all our American listeners who don't use liters, but... Guys, the the whole world uses leaders, except for you guys, so get on board. No, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, but okay. Anyway, okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) But let's say that your tank is 50 liters, okay? So many couples, guys, so many are going to pay for 300 liters to fill up that tank because only a fraction of what they put gets in. That's so much money, that's so much time. Guys, why try so hard when you can just try smart? A lot of couples get mad at the car. Guys, they're pumping so much gas and it's just not going in the car. And then, like, it's, they, they get mad. They, like, kick the car. If you ever, like, seen somebody kick a tire at a gas station because they're mad at the car, I don't know, maybe they got shocked or something from, like, the way that they picked up the nozzle or maybe, I don't know, it's too expensive. I don't know. Guys, you can't kick the car. Okay, anyone who's ever kicked a car tire knows it's going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt the car. Don't try getting a fight with a car. Guys, the car is always going to win. Always. Always. This thing is massive, okay? Like, it weighs like a thousand pounds. It's strong. It's made of, like, steel. You're not going to win a fight with a car. Okay? What you have to do is learn to get the gas in properly, okay? To, to figure out the struggle and to go to working. That is... That, that is how you transition out of the struggle is when you figure it out. It's like unlocking the treasure. How do you figure it out? We had some tips in the last episode on conversations you can have with your partner. For example, what do I need from you? What are you scared of? Okay, what, what am I scared of? To think about these things, to communicate them together. And we talked also in the last episode on tips to have this conversation with your partner while acknowledging that they may be sensitive around the discussion of their ability to be a good lover. Because many people are are very, very uncomfortable and it's very scary to talk about this for them. And we, we spoke of lots of tips. The biggest takeaway I'll bring again here is just remind your partner that It's about making your relationship better. Remind them that you're satisfied with the relationship, that you love them, that you feel safe with them, that you're here for them. Guys, people are scared of abandonment, okay? Everyone is scared of abandonment. Everyone, guys. And the ones that pretend that they're not scared are the most scared deep down. It's just that the fear of admitting that they're scared of it is so much that they pretend that it's not there. You want to always reassure your partner that you're there for them, okay? To trust them that it's okay, but that you want to make things better because you can always, always, always make things better. We talked about using soft startups, like saying I instead of saying you. Um, 
and just trying to come from a place of kindness and respect and acknowledging your partner's soft spots and holding them, helping them calm down if, if they get overwhelmed, not getting mad at them for having soft spots. Guys, people have soft spots. Everyone has soft spots, okay? We're going to talk about them a lot more in future episodes, maybe even the next episode, because it's so important. Next up in this episode, we went through those five love languages, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. I want to know, did you guys guess them when I gave you time to think about it? If you guess them correctly or incorrectly, send us an email about what you thought about that. Um, we're very, very curious to know what you think about this podcast, what you like, what you want to see and hear. Please let us know at contact at learnlove.ca. Finally, we talked about the, the conversation when your partner tells you, I feel like you're not noticing. Like, I feel like I'm trying so much and it's not getting to you. It could be two things. It could be a lens. A lens. Remember, what lenses do you see the world by related to the cycle of doom that we talked about, which is when you see your partner out of anger, you see things as anger, you don't notice them, okay, even if they're good. Or you can see things out of a place of love and notice the love more. Remember, guys, most partners don't see everything, everything that their partner does for them. It's probable that you see maybe two-thirds, okay? Maybe. And if you're in a bad place, maybe you see one-third. So, guys, just remember, your partner is trying harder than what you see, okay? It's so important. They're trying harder than what you see. You only see a fraction of what they do. You only get the gas that's in the tank, but you miss all the gas. You don't you don't see the gas that spills. They paid for 300 liters, but you only see 50 liters. And then you get mad at your partner because there's only 50 liters. And they're like, I tried to put 300 and you didn't notice. Okay. So why, why are they not noticing? Um, could be the cycle, could be a love language thing. Okay. Remember, maybe they're speaking to you in beautiful Japanese, but you see the world in Spanish. And guys, remember, because you only see a fraction of what your partner's doing, try to be very grateful. I know it's hard to be grateful sometimes, and everyone's saying be grateful, but honestly, for everything you see, your partner is doing more. Finally, finally, some of you are going to have the question, what if I have more than one love language? I kept this to the end because I wanted to get through the languages, the examples, and everything first. And the answer to this is, you may have multiple. People speak many languages. Maybe your main language is words of affirmation, and your second main is acts of service, and your third biggest is quality time. It may be for your partner, too, that they have multiple. Work to understand what, your, what yours is and what your partner's is. A really helpful activity you can do right now, if you're listening to this podcast, in a place where you can type or sit down, or if you're walking and there's traffic around, you don't do this now, do it later, please. Your life is more important. Make a list of what you think your love languages are, and make a list of what you think your partners are. Ask your partner to do the same after you teach them about the love languages, and remember, there are tons of quizzes online that you can do too. I hope they'll be helpful to you. And then see, guys, see if you got it right. See if you got it right. Like, if you put, like, guess your partner's, ask your partner to guess yours, and then see if you guys guessed correctly. It was so much fun. You can talk about it together. Um, Make time for this. Plan it in advance. Also, is another good idea, just so that you have a few, enough time to do it. And and I really, really hope that through this understanding of your partner, you'll come to love them more, get them more, and just feel safer and more comfortable around them. Guys, remember, people are people, okay? Like, we think we know everything about them, but we really don't. We get mad at them for not understanding us, but guys, we are so complicated, too. Love is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Thank you for listening, guys. Please let us know your comments by contacting us. Again, the email is contact at learnlove.ca. Let us know how the conversation went with your partner, and if you're able to guess your partner's love languages, Check out the rest of our show. We have lots more coming your way on childhood, parenting, soft spots, intimacy. We're going to talk about different kinds of sex. That's another big thing from Sue Johnson. Synchrony, solace, and sealed off. Really, really interesting stuff. 
we're going to talk all about shame, growth. We have new articles on the cycle of shame and the cycle of growth with some nice infographics on our blog, learnlove.ca slash blog. We're going to be talking all about love disorders like love addiction, sex addiction, what do they look like, relationship dynamics. For example, are you in a love addict, love dependent relationship? And more, guys. Submit us what you want to hear or send us your content if you want to be featured on the show. If you have a compelling story or lesson that you think people need to hear, send us an email, contact at learnlove.ca. We can't wait to hear from you. Thanks again for joining us on this episode and we'll catch you in the next one.